Uh, good evening and welcome to the uh, February meeting of the River Forest Service Club. Uh, we begin our meeting with the Pledge to the Flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Did I do that? <laughs> Jeez. See, I Make said it was easy there. Did all night. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Robert Graham, and I'm president of the River Forest Service Club. Uh, we're co-hosting tonight's forum uh, with the League of uh, Women Voters of Oak Park and River Forest. And um, uh, the River Forest Service Club is a nonpartisan organization and does not take a position uh, supporting any of the candidates. Uh, the, uh, some administrative things, uh, I would appreciate that everyone would turn off their cell phones so we're, there's no interruption in the middle of a program. Uh, also, on a month from today, Thursday, March 21st, there, we will have right here at Concordia in room 200, uh, we will have another forum for the uh, Village of River Forest candidates for president and for uh, village trustees. The um, um, at, also, at the conclusion of tonight's forum, there will be a brief intermission, and at which time the candidates and any uh, members of the audience can have a meet and greet with the candidates out in the uh, entrance hallway here. Um, our moder moderator for tonight is Peggy Kell. I would like to uh, turn over the program to Peggy, who will be uh, the moderator for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, and thank you to the River Forest Service Organization for allowing us to partner with them for tonight's uh, event. Um, the League is also a nonpartisan um, organization, and we encourage everybody to be informed and active participants um, in their local, state, national, and world. Um, and to that end, if you are interested in becoming a member of the League, we have uh, forms out on our registration table. Also on the table out there is um, a green half sheet that has information about the upcoming elections, uh, when they are voting uh, deadlines. Um, so that's good information for you to have. Um, I'd also like to thank the League members who are here. Uh, if they would just stand up, we have a, a for helping uh, participate in this tonight. Just stand up and wave. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank you, the public, for coming out tonight because uh, it shows that you are interested in what's happening in your community and nothing shines a light on democracy uh, more than people being involved in um, finding out about their candidates. I'd like to thank the candidates themselves for running um, because without people getting involved in the democratic process, um, we have no democracy. So thank you very much for your time, your effort. Um, even though it takes you away from your family, it's much appreciated um, by the League, quite frankly, and with the community. Our format tonight is one um, where candidates will give, be given three minutes to introduce themselves. The order of their speaking was drawn um, by random picking out of a hat, so to speak, or an envelope for speaking order. So they will have three minutes to introduce themselves. The league's process always is that we stick to that time frame. To that end, there is a wonderful member that has her little paddles there, um, and she will hold up the paddle when there's one minute, and 30 seconds, and 15 seconds, and then there's a little stop sign. Um, and that means that your time is over, and I will very cordially um, butt in <laughs> and get you to stop um, to, so that we can keep to our time frame. Um, after that, we will have questions, hopefully from the audience, that will be one minute in duration. Each candidate will be able, uh, will answer each of these questions um, for one minute. The order will then just kind of rotate down. So um, David starts um, with the introductions. As we go to the uh, question part, then we move down, and Teresa, you would be the first one for the first question. We will be videotaping tonight, um, and that will be shared electronically um, after 
this event. So if you missed something or you didn't think you heard something, um, hopefully you didn't nod off during this. Uh, you can always check that video to see what happened. Um, also after, like Bob said, at about probably 8.15, 8.20, we will end this and the candidates will be out in the hall and we hope that if you have any more questions or you'd like to get any more information from them, that's the time to um, use that for a little meet and greet um, at that time. So without further ado, um, our first um, candidate who will introduce himself is David Latham. Good evening. Um, my name is David Latham. Um, I have lived off and on in River Forest since 1976. I graduated from Oak Park River Forest High School in 1979. Um, my parents lived at 626 William. I now live at 926 William, so uh, I don't move very far. Uh, I have two daughters, one of whom is here tonight. Um, she is in ninth grade. I have another daughter who is dancing tonight at uh, Roosevelt, Katie, and my wife is here. Um, I am a lawyer. I work downtown. I have my own practice. <clears throat> um, I've been asked to address a couple of issues tonight, and, and I'll do so. Well, the first one is, how do you see your job if elected? Um, I am an incumbent, and I've been on the board for four years. Um, and I see my job as part of a board. And the board hires the superintendent, Ed Condon, who we hired a couple of years ago, and I'm very happy to have done so. The board sets the objectives for Mr. Condon. We review his performance of those objectives. Uh, we approve, disapprove, and comment on his uh, means to accomplish those objectives. Um, the board also, I think, um, puts a little muscle behind Mr. Condon's decisions by voting in favor of what he would like to do. That is what I see the board. We are really the employer of Mr. Condon, and he employs the rest of the, the school staff and the teachers. Um, and it, it leads into my particular role on the board and also my next, que uh, next question, which is what are your top priorities if elected? Um, I have been the chair of the Education Committee and Tech Committee since I was on the board, since I was elected to the board in, in 2009. Um, as, um, in, those, in that capacity, um, I deal with the curriculum, um, and I work with Ed, very closely on that, and uh, Martha. Brian Toy, I believe is her last name. Um, in that capacity, um, my primary in, uh, areas of interest, um, and there are many, are differentiation, which is attempting to give each student as much of an, ooh, 15 seconds? OK, <laughs> differentiation. Common Core is going to be one of the, the big um, uh, issues in the, in the future. Uh, I was a big pusher of the iPad initiative. Um, and now I'm done. Wow, I thought I had two minutes worth of talk. Three minutes, but three minutes goes very it quickly. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> um, and, and what I want to add, too, is that cards were passed out. So if you have any questions for the candidates, um, please fill out those cards and pass them to the ends of your aisle, um, your row. Your aisle. No, your And one of our members will pick it up, and then we'll make sure that that becomes part of our uh, question uh, segment. Uh, next is Teresa Peavy. Hi, I'm Teresa Peavy, and I have lived in River Forest for about 17 years, and I currently have two children in the River Forest schools. I have worked in government relations, uh, either in nonprofit organizations or in actual government, for over 20 years. Um, but I've also been a volunteer th at the Lincoln and Roosevelt schools. Um, I most recently served as PTO president at Lincoln. Um, and my husband, who grew up in Oak Park, he's been a lifelong Oak Park River Forest resident, is also a volunteer. He's probably coached some of your children or grandchildren in football or basketball. 
Um, I came across a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt that kind of sums up why he and I volunteer and why I'm actually seeking this office. And Mrs. Roosevelt said, never ask anyone to do something you're not willing to do yourself. And I just want to go on record and say I think Rose of, or, uh, River Forest has excellent schools, and I just want to continue to see that happen, um, continue to have the good schools that we have. Um, if elected, I see our job as a board in ke is keeping our community strong through the good schools. Um, I think board members need to believe in the value of public education. They need to be dedicated to serving um, and teaching all children. They need to believe in the democratic process, and they need to understand that their role is strategically, is to act strategically and in line with the interests of the entire community. Um, I believe board members uh, should have the ability to work well with others and support group decisions. I know there are times when not everyone agrees with um, a board decision that has been made, but I think as a board member, you have to support whatever the group has decided. But you also need a desire to work toward a stronger relationship between the district and the public it serves, and that includes families with children in the schools as well as um, those who don't have children in the schools. Um, if elected, my top priorities would include helping initiate that new curriculum. Um, Common Core is one of the most important initiatives to take place in recent years, and it's going to take a strong board to make sure the teachers have the tools they need to move forward and that the parents have the communication they need so that the students can learn. Um, I also believe that um, we need to create successful students um, in line with the mission of District 90 Schools all the while maintaining fiscal responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is um, Ann Gottlieb. Hello, I'm Ann Gottlieb. Uh, my husband and I and our family moved to River Forest nine years ago. Uh, I have three sons, two at Willard Elementary and one um, at Roosevelt. Um, I try to get into the schools whenever I can. I've been a room mom, art parent, um, helped chair the family reading night at Willard. Um, and when I'm not all active with my kids, I am the assistant principal at an alternative high school in the city, in the Austin neighborhood, um, and have done that for many years. Um, started out as an English teacher, so I've been dedicated to education in my career. Um, I have sat on the board uh, at West Suburban Temple in River Forest, and I coordinate their PADS dinners um, there monthly um, when PADS is serving. So I believe in public service. Um, the role, as I see a board and a board member, <clears throat> are really to, to do three key things. Um, one is strategic planning, kind of setting the course um, for the district, which we're in the middle of the strategic plan now, um, but that will be um, needed to be monitored and um, come up again during the next term. Um, the second, second large role of a board, um, I believe, is to, you know, what are we doing now? What does um, what, what the uh, school district look like now and um, how is it functioning? And that, which is the third point, um, which is really monitoring. How are we assessing um, how we're doing um, faculty, test scores, um, you know, across the board and, you know, is what we're doing working? So those three um, main um, jobs of the board to be done together. So in doing that, I think a good board member has to definitely, you know, be listening to input um, other board members and the, um, all the stakeholders in the district, be building consensus, um, and really working very closely with the superintendent and superintendent administrative office of the district to really make sure that the district is going, um, you know, where uh, in the positive direction where we want it to go. My husband and I definitely moved here um, for the school district, and so we want to see that continue um, in its excellence. Um, lastly, my top priorities um, would definitely be maintaining the fiscal responsibility. There's a long tradition in the school district, um, and having worked in Chicago for all my professional life, I know how fortunate we are um, to um, be fiscally responsible and have those resources for our children. But that needs to be closely um, monitored and um, kept in check so that that continues. Um, 
equity in the schools. We do have diversity, socioeconomic, and um, racial diversity, and to make sure all students are getting access to the best education possible. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Roman Ebert. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the River Forest Service Club and the League of Women Voters for sponsoring this event. So thanks for having us. Um, my name is Roman Ebert, and I'm a father of three sons, all of which are in the district, but I am excited that I do get to pass along a diploma to my oldest son in just a couple months, and yes, I'm probably going to embarrass him by giving him a hug, but I'm not going to tell him. Um, I've been on the school board since 2009, and I would like to be elected for another four years. Um, over the past few years, I've really come to enjoy the work that we do on the board. Um, I was finance chair previously, and I'm currently the policy chair. Um, I think I was originally recruited to run on the board because people saw me around the schools a lot. Um, I have a flexible schedule at work, so it really allows me to uh, kind of take some time off of work and volunteer in the classrooms, and, and that's really what I did. Uh, I volunteered in all my kids' classrooms from kindergarten through about second or third grade as a math helper and a writer's workshop person and a reader's workshop person. Um, and I really got a lot of satisfaction working with the children uh, when I was volunteering. And I do continue to volunteer when I can now, too. Um, I was also on the uh, nursery school board over at First United when my children were younger, and also uh, for two years on the board of a trade association, the Association of Visual Packaging Manufacturers. It's not very popular, but it's a trade association my company's a part of. Um, I am a CPA and was an auditor for Arthur Anderson for about four years right out of college, so I do have a financial background. And that experience, and, uh, financial experience does help you know, oversee things at the board. I'm a co-owner of a printing company right now, and it's about 34 total people, so it's small enough that I know everyone who works for me. It's also small, so I have to do a lot of it myself. I manage my salespeople, do production, purchasing, HR, a little bit of everything. Um, I think this work experience and business experience is, is, uh, has given me uh, the opportunity to work with others and to, to manage people, and I think that's valuable. I think I bring a unique perspective to the board as well, coming from a manufacturing background instead of uh, maybe a service-based uh, doctor or something. Um, it took a while, to really, to get informed understand the issues and how the board operates. Uh, now that I have four years experience, uh, I feel a lot more comfortable and I think the momentum of the board is working uh, real well and is moving forward uh, at a good pace. Uh, we get along well together and, and, uh, and it's important to, uh, to keep things moving. Um, I've lived in River Forest my entire life. I went to Willard and Roosevelt here in River Forest. I really do love this village and think that uh, public service as a board member is how I can uh, do my part to keep your course great. Um, and one of the reasons why I uh, did an active volunteer in the schools is I lost my father to cancer when I was 11 years old in sixth grade. And you know, from that point on, I you know, saw a social worker and got a lot of support from the district. So I feel that I owe the district something in return. So I'd like to continue to work for the board and uh, another four years. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, last, Pat Meyer. Do I get all the extra time? That <laughs> <laughs> no. It accumulates. It accumulates. Speed talk. All right. Um, hi, I'm Pat Meyer, and I am running for re-election um, for District 90 School Board. Um, the reason I'm running this election year is, is essentially the same as the reason that I ran four years ago. Um, River Forest Schools have been very good to my family. And serving on the school board is one way that I can contribute back to the schools and to our community. My wife, Uta, and I have been blessed with six children. In addition to my daughter, Sammy, who's currently in the fourth grade at Lincoln School, my sons, Alex, Phil, Lucas, and my daughter, Hannah, all attended District 90 schools before continuing at OPRF, college, grad school, and beyond. When they walked down the aisle to receive their Roosevelt diploma at the end of eighth grade, they were all very well prepared for the challenges ahead. You know, when I, when I ran for the board four years ago, the primary item that was on my agenda at the time was to make a contribution to help ensure that we continue our tradition of excellence in education. Uh, four years later, I still have one primary item on my agenda, and, and it really remains the same, which is to help ensure that we continue this tradition for our kids and for future generations. And this time I also have the benefit of four years of experience, so I can be up and running immediately. Currently I, I, I have a couple of hats that I wear on the school board. I'm currently the vice president. I'm also the chair of the personnel committee. 
You know, a lot is asked of us as board members, maybe even more than I realized when I, I first signed up for this four years ago, but just in the past couple of years alone, we've been asked to become as knowledgeable as possible about such diverse subjects as pension financing, executive recruiting, thank you, Ed, glad to have you here. <laughs> Um, the implementation of the Common Core curriculum, the impact of full-day kindergarten on our children, and most recently, the safety difference between 60-degree, 90-degree, and parallel parking. <laughs> I am also a River Forest taxpayer, and it's my obligation as a board member to not only support our educational mission, but it's also to do so in a fiscally responsible manner that fully understand, so fully understand and appreciate the views of all stakeholders in the community, whether or not they have children in our schools. There's so much to be grateful for in River Forest. We're blessed with the fact that there's really nothing broken with our public schools. To the contrary, we have exceptionally strong schools academically and financially, and our entire community has done an amazing job of supporting our mission. Sure, we have challenges, though. Issues such as adoption of the Common Core curriculum, changes to the way our teachers are evaluated, and financial unknowns such as the possible transfer of pension liabilities to individual school districts. I've immersed myself in these issues as a member of the board, and I feel I'm well prepared to continue contributing to the dialogue and providing leadership. My dear, <laughs> I'm about to get a stop sign. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll cut it off, thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, now we will start the questions um, of each candidate. They will be one minute in length, so it's short answers. Um, we will start with um, Teresa Peavy with the first question, and then each person will, uh, all, all candidates will answer the same question, but Teresa will start it off. What measurable, measurable benefits have we seen from introducing technology to the K-5 grades, and how do you manage the cost of that technology? through social media and whoa, um, I think that the sooner the children get educated on how to responsibly use technology, the better off they're going to be as they move into the future. Um, even starting at a young age, in K through uh, five, just knowing how to use a computer. Um, you know, back in my day, I didn't learn how to type until I was a junior in high school and it's the best thing I ever learned how to do. And my child can now type as well as I can, and she's in fifth grade. Thank you. Um, Anne? Uh, from what I've seen of my children's experience with the technology are a few things. One, um, the group problem solving, and um, as well as individual problem solving that's done on the computers is amazing and with the technology. Um, certainly learning how to search for answers with technology is something that they're going to continually need to do, um, continually be doing um, throughout school and beyond. How to discern data and sources, um, they need to learn how to do that. It's not going to be going to the library and getting out in the encyclopedia or knowing the book and the author. It's going to be knowing on the internet <coughs> where to go um, and what sources are credible. Um, so I've seen that. Learning how to communicate in that way. Um, as Teresa said, the typing, the social media um, that my sixth grader has started to use on Edmodo, um, but even the, the younger grades communicating in that way through the use of technology. Um, and it, it's definitely the wave of the future and what they're going to need in terms of skills as they move on in their schooling. Thank you. Uh, Roman? Um, the K through five technology, um, obviously it's Obviously, it's very important um, with the use of smart boards and what have you, although there's a cautionary thing about this. I was told by one of my third grader that the smart board was down for a day and the teacher was having trouble teaching the class. So there has to be some balance of the old school stuff versus the new school. But uh, all in all, I think the children are really learning a lot using iPads and the, the Macs and the computers at home. Uh, they learn from their older brothers a little bit, and they become very, they adapt very quickly and learn these new technologies, which will let them, you know, succeed in the future as things more and more are technologically 
uh, you know, oriented. And uh, River Forest has, you know, is kind of blessed that they do have a very strong technology program, and we need to keep that, uh, keep that going and keep it strong uh, so they'll continue to succeed. Thank you. Um, Pat? Sure. <clears throat> sure. Um, you know, for me, uh, and I've often been called a, as Mark Coe will attest, a technology nerd as a, a shared passion of ours, but um, I, I think it's important that we keep it in the proper perspective. And, and to me, technology is a tool. It's not an end in and of itself. Um, and it's a tool to, to help our children sort of reach out to the world that they live in um, in ways that my generation could not, and in fact, my kids who are now in college didn't have the same technology advantages that kids do today um, in, in our <coughs> River Forest schools. I, I also think that it's important, particularly living in the community that we live in where our kids are exposed to technology at home constantly. My daughter's had an iPad for two years and that's not uncommon as a fourth grader. When you go into school, you don't want to be taking a step backwards. You don't want to have a calculator at home and go to school and have an abacus. I think that the technology that our kids are very used to at home is something that we need to be able to comfortably translate over to when they go into the learning environment. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, David? Uh, when we were introducing or, or proposing the iPad program uh, for the eighth graders in Roosevelt, Kevin Martin made a presentation that really stuck with me. He made a distinction between our generation, which are foreigners to technology, and our kids' generation, which are native to technology. It is in their system. It is in their DNA. It's how they live. And it's much different than how we or my generation grew up within te uh, technology. Introducing it into schools is, is inevitable, as Mr. Martin said, and I agree with that. Uh, go, in fact, <coughs> uh, my, wife want, my, my wife is my cutting service, and she found a picture of a play school toy where you could insert an iPhone for three-year-olds. <laughs> that's, where, that's where the technology is going. But technology is, is, is nothing if it doesn't do something for kids, and what I've learned is that kids learn at their own speed and their own depth with a tech with a computer in front of them and that's one of the reasons why we've pushed it in in uh, the Roosevelt schools thank you all right we're going to move on to Ann. you're going to start off this next uh, question what would you do to ease the tax burden on taxpayers and still maintain quality of schools <clears throat> hmm. um, I think that Every decision that's made um, in, uh, on, by the board um, at the recommendation of the superintendent needs to be um, <clears throat> carefully reviewed to the, to the um, serving the needs of the students the most, um, the most, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, not frugal, but most um, cost effective um, in the most cost effective way. Um, that's the best use of taxpayer dollars and to make sure that every student is being served um, to the highest of ability, their, you know, the ability that we can and using, making those dollars stretch the most. Um, that's what I would say. Thank you. Roman? Um, well, thankfully, River Forest is kind of blessed with a healthy fund balance right now, and that kind of comes from a history of fiscal responsibility, not just from this board or the one before or the one before, but it goes far back. Um, I guess to contain costs, which so to either keep the taxes not going up as high or not going as high or as fast, somewhere around 80 or 82 percent of the uh, the costs are really labor related. It's for the staff and it's for the teachers. So that's really where it would need to be maintained. It's not just on pencils and paper. It's really the labor costs. That's most of our budget. So to every contract, we need to be fiscally responsible with the teachers unions and with everyone to make sure that the costs are, are reasonable if there's increases, but not excessive. And that's really the place to, uh, to watch things. But overall, I think there are some opportunities maybe to partner with District 97 or District 200 or the village or perhaps the park district on some shared uh, you know, economies of scale. If we can help out the village, the village can help us, help us out. They have trucks and equipment and things to, uh, to help. So that, there. Thank you. Pat? And just to build on some of the comments, because there's a lot of what's being said that I absolutely agree with. Um, you know, in the last <clears throat> four years, there have been uh, 
there have been two occasions where um, uh, District 90 could have increased uh, property taxes a bit higher, um, and we chose to kind of turn our back on that. And, <clears throat> and, and it, it's work that I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of as, as a school board member, and it's really being driven by some very thorough planning that we do at the district level and at the board level in terms of seeing what we have, what we need, what our fund balance should be in order to be healthy, but perhaps not to cross that line and have too large of a fund balance. So, so I think we, we have done an excellent job of managing our finances the last four years um, to a couple of points that were already made. There's no grandiose idea out there. You can't just wave a magic wand and cut taxes, but I do think every single spending issue that comes before the board, we need to take a look at it very carefully and make sure we're striking the right balance between the needs of the kids and, and the taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you. David? Uh, about 18 months ago, um, Ed Conn and I went to a uh, seminar put on by the Illinois School Board Association. So, and, and this is one of the, their points, so it doesn't sound so harsh um, coming just from me, but you look at every program with a cost-benefit analysis. Um, if, if, if you're spending money and you're not getting anything out of it, you're wasting money. You're wasting money you could use on another program. Um, I would also like to see us review programs to make sure that we're still getting a cost-benefit uh, a plus cost benefit out of them. Um, one of the things that I've always pushed on the board and, and, and I think all of the board members um, agree with is that a referendum should be for extraordinary exp uh, expenditures only. And we should live within what we can tax without going to the taxpayers for uh, additional funds through a referendum. Um, and I I try to avoid um, the appearance in the board of having resources chasing needs, where we have the resources and we try to, f oh, <laughs> sorry. <You're done. laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Teresa? Um, first, let me say I do agree with what everybody else has been saying. Um, sometimes there are uh, financial problems that arise or financial issues that arise, um, such as the state mandating Common Core and having to introduce a whole new curriculum, or if the state decides that pensions have to come back to the district. Um, that's something we can't control. We have to figure out how to deal with it. But I do think um, what a board, the board should do in every decision it makes is look at the strategic plan. Um, the strategic plan was adopted in 2010, and you know, it's not just a document that's sitting out there. It has, uh, it should have a life and people should follow it. And if something is in within the strategic plan and it's something that the board has already said this is important to the school district, we should look at where those resources can be found. Um, if it's not something in the strategic plan, it's just something that um, a group of people want to have included, um, then we have to look at, again, that cost benefit analysis. Thank you. Uh, the next question will start with Roman. Um, management and analysis of student test data is a huge task for a district. How should District 90 use this data as a tool for improvement and change? Um, it is a huge task and there's a lot of data out there uh, with MAPS testing and a lot of the new testing where they can follow the, the children over time. Um, it does take a lot. Uh, it's, it should be used not just to rank our school versus another school. I think that's short-sighted. What they need to do is use it to identify weaknesses in certain children. If they're not doing great at geometry, let's find out why and try to improve that. Um, but really focus in on what the needs are for the children. If there is something that's common through a lot of kids that they're missing something out, maybe we need to add something to the curriculum. Uh, and we are going to find that out very soon with the new Common Core Standards, as everyone is saying, uh, and also the new tests we're having uh, that are being developed that we're really not sure of exactly what they are. But uh, it's going to take a while once we get those tests and get the results, look at the data, and uh, you know, not just look and see 92% are exceeding or meeting, but really drill down and see where the needs are and what we're missing so we can move some of those kids who are not meeting to exceed. Thank you. Pat? <clears throat> sure. T Teresa, you mentioned the strategic plan a minute ago. I, I think 
for those of you familiar with that document, nowhere in the strategic plan does it say that one of our goals is to raise test scores. And, and I think that that's by design. It doesn't mean that high test scores are not a good thing. They're a good thing, but there shouldn't be an end in and of themselves. Um, Roman, to your point, um, using the test to identify weaknesses and ways that we can adjust the curriculum, I think is absolutely the way to look at those test scores. Um, the, the purpose of those scores beyond that, in my opinion, is somewhat limited. And uh, again, reflecting back on what's in the strategic plan, that came out of input from a broad cross-section of the all stakeholders in River Forest, those with kids here and, and those who are property owners and want to make sure their property values stay high. So I do think we're placing the right priority and emphasis on tests by using them to help identify weaknesses. Thank you. David? Uh, further to, to what Pat said, when we rewrote the school's uh, mission, we used the word whole child to specifically incorporate the idea that we're not simply looking at test scores. Uh, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not a firm believer in test scores. I think on a group, on a group level, because you have a large sample size, you get a great deal of information. But on an individual level, um, you leave some kids behind and you get false positives and false negatives on an individual level. And that's, that's been my philosophy, that teaching is part art and part science. And the art part comes in looking at kids who, who, who maybe not test well, but have something in them, a spark, that allows us to find a path for them that, that test scores may not dictate. Um, we do, a, a, we do a, a very good job with test scores, and, and, but we uh, can do more in the area of, of um, recruiting kids based upon uh, standards other than test scores. Thank you. Teresa? Mm -hmm. um, I agree with what everybody said here. I think that the use of standardized testing should really be used to help the students. Um, I actually met with a couple of teachers this week just to talk about what they think is important um, for a school board member to bring to the table. And they were talking to me about using one of the standardized tests, um, Ames Web, to help students get the help they need when they need it and not wait for a yearly test that comes you know, once a year and you don't get the results for six more months. Um, the tests that they have now are tests that they can give the children and have the results within a few days, a few weeks, and they can get the children the help they need at that time to get them uh, more focused on the help they need. Um, if a child doesn't do well in a certain area, the teacher can then step in and say, okay, we're going to do this to help that child. Um, I think that that is a much better use of our uh, use of standardized testing. Thank you. Ann? Um, assessment and data are not just uh, MAPS testing or ISAT testing, and those are useful tools, um, and they're most useful if teachers know how to use them, because if teachers don't know how to read that data, then nothing is going to change in the classroom, and nothing will help a kid um, address those weaknesses. So making sure that, you know, Dr. Condon and our principals get <clears throat> teacher training in to be able to use that data. But assessment is also about what David was alluding to, which is executive function and kind of teaching students these other skills, which are going to be big predictors in later success. Grit, conscientiousness, um, perseverance. Are they able to power through something, not just get the right answer at the end? Or how quickly can they get that answer? So how are we using assessment in other ways to address other skills? Um, is, a, is the uh, one trend coming in education that um, needs to be addressed and and in looking at the whole child you want to be able to do both academic and um, and um, these executive function or other type of skills also thank you um, our next question and Pat we'll start with you on this one how should we address the issue of marijuana and other illegal substances other illegal substance use in our middle school um, are there any programs currently in place what resources would be available? Um, sure, I, I guess maybe I would start by um, saying that we, we don't live in a bubble here in River Forest, and, and I think sometimes people kind of have that perception, but, um, but, but we do, <clears throat> we, we definitely have challenges in our community, maybe not as severe as in other communities, but, but to suggest that they don't exist is, is, is I think, naive. 
Um, <clears throat> I, I think that there are clearly two parts to what we need to do to address specifically marijuana use or that of any illegal substance. Um, one is both education around why it's wrong in the first place, and, and two is to make sure that we act swiftly and help the child get into the proper kind of program where we do identify that somebody in, in fact does need the help. Um, <clears throat> in both of those cases, um, as a school district, we are, are already fairly active. I think perhaps more on the second half of it than on the first half of it around education. Um, and it's an area where I think we could probably be a little bit stronger. Um, just uh, recently, within the last uh, day or so here for, okay, I'm cut off. Okay, sorry. All right. <laughs> the big stop sign. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, David? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't stop at marijuana. Uh, I would stop, I, I would start at, at, at a, a, a problem which was not so prevalent when I was in school, and that is prescription drugs. We also have alcohol problems, uh, or, al uh, or uh, problems with alcohol. Um, dealing with it is difficult. We, we, have, we do have a very strong mental health program in, in the school, and, and we need to, to use that uh, with these kids as much as possible. Um, I'm not a big fan of, of, of a zero tolerance type approach to this, because there are kids who there are kids who make a mistake, and there are kids who make lots of mistakes, and there are different, and there's differences between them. And if you apply the same standards to both of them, I think you miss the boat. It is, it is something we need to address quickly in in, in every child. It is something uh, that we have the resources uh, to do. Uh, we have the interventionists, which is a program in Oak Park, which uh, which is has expertise in this. And with that, I'm done. Um, you, I, I think I agree that um, knowledge is power, and if the students know what um, the problems are with not just marijuana, but other kinds of drug use, um, and um, I think sometimes knowing um, doesn't really solve the answer because there's a whole myriad of other issues going on. Um, I think one of the things that we are lucky is to have three schools the size that the administrators can know all of the children. Um, they may not know them in depth or well, but they know who all of them are and um, can n uh, name them and, and reach out to them if they feel they need help. I also feel that the schools um, need to have a really strong relationship with other um, government bodies, with the village, uh, police and fire department, with the other schools, and. The, um, District 200, um, Oak Park, any of the other schools, just so you know, we know who's um, around. And thank you, <laughs> Ann. Um, it, it definitely takes a village, right? So the school needs to be in touch, um, definitely, with their students and have that um, community and trust within the school. Um, there needs to be outreach and programming to families. I attended last year with my fifth grader um, an event at Roosevelt bringing um, parents and kids together to talk about drug use, starting to talk about scenarios and um, situations, having parents being able to talk to each other. So the school's providing that opportunity um, as an intervention. And when it does, when it does happen, interve intervening and um, early and um, at, with the whole child and the families. Um, I think is a way to, um, and not necessarily in a wholly punitive way, but in a you know help and um, corrective way. Um, so all of those things, we do have a tremendous amount of resources, and and the schools um, being plugged into those and being able to um, help the student and um, families conquer the conquer, conquer those issues. Thank you, <laughs> Roman. Um, our mission statement deals with an unwavering commitment to the whole child, and I think that whole child is much more than just the academics. It's a lot of the socio-emotional health, which kind of goes back to some of like some drug use issues and those types of things where poor decisions are made and uh, some bad behaviors are done. Uh, so we're, we currently do work with or have access to the interventionists that, that David mentioned out of Oak Park. and. Uh, they're going to be contacted soon if they haven't been already. Uh, but they are a good resource that we can, uh, we can use their expertise and to develop some programs to uh, you know, overall show the kid or tell the kids and to discuss with the kids uh, what's right and what's wrong and the consequences of their actions. Um, 
and I think it's also important to communicate to the parents uh, those drug forms out of through Oak Park. I think it was last year that those were taking place. Uh, it's it's never too early to start. It's we can't just close our eyes and say you know they're going to be okay until they hit high school. Then we have to worry about it. We need to you know be concerned about it now and uh, for our kids' future. Thank you. Um, Next question, really meaty. What is your assessment of the Oak Street angle parking safety concern? <laughs> and David, we're starting back with you. Um, there are three proposals. The, the, first of all, the, the, the need for the parking came from the need to make the parking lot north of the school, which is now the front of the school, which used to be the back of the school. <laughs> Uh, we need to make that parking area safe. In doing so, we eliminated a lot of parking spaces. So we looked to the Oak Street uh, as a possible way of, of, of increasing parking. In doing that, we, we looked at 45 degree parking, 60 degree parking, and 90 degree parking. Um, partly based on, on, the need, on, on, on using it as a one-way street or as a two-way street. Um, whatever we do, we can't transfer the lack of safety in the north parking lot to a lack of safety on Oak Street. Um, and, and I think that there are differences in safety based on those three proposals. Thank you. Teresa? Mm, I agree. And as a parent who has picked my child up on Oak Street for the past three years, um, it's, something should be done now. It's not safe now. Um, Parents pull up at 320 and they will double park. They will park all around the area. And um, a better place to have children meet their parents would be a better option than any of the proposals that are out there right now. But I think um, uh, I do agree that student safety is, is number one. And I think that that's what needs to be considered first and foremost, um, what is safest for our students. Um, they are there nine months out of the year there's summer school so and there's events in the evenings on the weekends so whatever option is the safest for the students is the one that should be chosen thank you Anne. um it's not an easy situation because any which way it happens and shakes out there's going to be change so um which is difficult to deal with uh and oak street is a very heavily use street and river for, for river foresters. Um, and so it's, it's going to be a change. Uh, I think that I, I have to say that reviewing all the documents and the plans and um, how the process has gone, and the board is making every effort to get input, to canvas the neighborhood, to talk to the neighboring bodies, the library, the tennis club, uh, the church. Um, there's a meeting next Wednesday. All of you, anyone concerned should attend. Um, so I think that the process has been open, um, transparent, trying to um, really decide what's best for students and the land and what's best in terms of being a good neighbor. And that's about as much as you can ask for when um, well, there's going to be a change that is not going to be popular with 100% of the people. So um, that's where we are. Thank you. Roman? Um, yeah, it goes back to we are going to be in need of additional spots of parking, and safety is the key factor. We can't do anything that's unsafe, and we definitely don't want to make anything less safe than it is now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I really do look forward, actually, to the community meeting next on the 27th next week, so we can get the input from those people who are interested and concerned. Um, there haven't been too many comments that we've heard as a board. Uh, up till now, at least uh, you know, through the normal channels, through coming to speak at our board meetings. Uh, but I do look forward to hearing other people's concerns, uh, the neighbors. Uh, Ed and Anthony, through the district, they did canvas kind of the neighborhood uh, adjacent to Roosevelt, door to door, uh, looking to, uh, to communicate that what we're doing and what we're looking at. Um, and hopefully this, this meeting next week will be you know, another opportunity to, for, to, to have people you know, say what they need to say. And uh, you know, if there are some viable options, we'd love to hear them. Uh, but the options have to be viable and reasonable and, and again, safe. Uh, that's Thank you. Pat? Um, <clears throat> this is uh, 
for me, it's been a bit of a surprise. Maybe one of the most challenging issues that we've tried to work through as a school board. Um, and when we first got into it, I'm not sure that's where we thought it would end up. Um, as much transparency as I think we believe we've had around this issue through a series of meetings and articles in the newspaper and all that, I think it's becoming increasingly clear that not all the stakeholders were aware of what our thoughts were around what we wanted to do on Oak Avenue. Um, I, I was not able to attend the village meeting the other night because I was at the school board meeting, but I went back and I listened to the MP3 audio of it. And uh, Mr. Voci, I know you were one of the more vocal individuals at that meeting. I pulled the reports from the Oregon State study, some fascinating things around the relative safety of parallel parking versus 90 degree parking versus 60 degree parking. Um, in my opinion, it's an issue we need to study a little bit further before we reach a final decision here, and I think next week's uh, community forum will help us to gather additional opinions and information. Thank you. Our last question for the evening, and Teresa, you'll start with this one. Are you an advocate for linking teacher compensation and improvement in their students' test scores? Um, I, am, I am not. Um, I, as I stated before, I think test scores should be used to help the students, um, it, but I think that there are issues that different children bring to standardized testing that the teacher cannot necessarily always address. Um, I have a sister who is a special education teacher, and she often has children who haven't eaten, haven't um, seen their parents, uh, in a few days, haven't, um, you know, maybe they haven't paid their bills, you know, maybe they don't have any uh, heat in their house. To expect a teacher to have every single student achieve a certain amount on a standardized test um, without knowing the background issues, I don't think is fair to the teacher. I think using standardized tests to help teachers better educate the whole child is what we use, need to use standardized testing for. And I think if they do that correctly, um, it will show in student improvement and will, that's how you can evaluate a teacher. Thank you. Anne? Um, I have seen some teacher evaluations that use test scores as part of an overall matrix uh, and maybe a small portion out of many different things being evaluated. Um, and that's about as far as I go with using the test scores. Um, for some of the reasons that Teresa illuminated, it is very difficult just based on a standardized test score at least to um, judge t teacher performance. There are a lot of other factors um, that I think go into a teacher performance um, based on observations, um, teacher goals that are set and met, um, working with the whole school and how they work as a you know fourth grade team member um, that can be addressed with the teacher in terms of evaluation that don't necessarily show up in a test score. So in a limited fashion, um, I've seen it used sometimes and can be um, part of an overall um, matrix of evaluation, but it, in a limited way. Thank you, Roman. Yeah, uh, student test scores. I I actually am an advocate and think they should be just one component of the overall evaluation of teacher. Not necessarily the most important. Not the most important one, actually, but uh, definitely a component uh, because it is me it is measurable. It's not a perfect measure because teachers get the children they get. They and you know that's not a great measure of how well they're actually uh, performing, the teacher that is. But in terms of uh, linking their compensation, I don't think that's proper at all. And the way the contracts are, it's not that if you get an excellent, you get a 6% raise, and if you're average, you get a 4% raise. That's not the way they're written. So currently, that's not even really on the table. Um, the way the, the contracts are currently written. But I do think that as part of the new teacher evaluation policy, which we're being forced to by the state, we will link it to some degree uh, student achievement and, on those test scores to the overall evaluation. Thank you. Pat? Sure. You, you know, um, this, is a, this is a tough issue. And it, it's tough because, um, like the Lake Wobegon, every teacher in the system is above average and, in fact, what we've seen is every teacher in the system is, is, is superior, is excellent, and there's been a lot of great inflation going on in terms of teacher evaluations for a long time. What's the best way to address it? I think the simplest way to address it is to base it on test scores. I also think that's absolutely the wrong way to address it. I think evaluating teacher performance is very complicated. Test scores are a small component, but a lot of it requires in-classroom observation, 
a greater sort of teaming role around how a particular teacher is doing in the classroom. I think there are exceptional teachers that because of perhaps the class of students they have may not have the world's highest test scores, but nevertheless, we kind of know it when we see it. So again, this is not an easy process, but it is a process that I think needs to be reformed and, and adjusted a bit. Thank you. Thank you. David? Uh, we are currently uh, mandated to come up with a teacher performance review program, so we're going to have to, to judge teachers somehow, some way. Um, I, I have never known a profession where every profession I've known has a diversity of talent, and, and I think the talent should be compensated accordingly, but I don't think test scores are the way to do it. Um, it, you, you, you have too many problems. You have teachers teaching to the test. You have skewing the test. You have false negatives and false positives in, uh, on, on, on students. And, and so I don't think test scores are the way to do it. And I'm, and, and, and I'm going to leave it to the professional, Mr. Ed Condon, Dr. Ed Condon, to come up with a way of, of doing a teacher performance review. But I do believe that there should be diversity in pay for teachers. Thank you. Um, uh, the League would really like to thank you for uh, coming out. You did a great job, and I think River Forest is well represented. Um, I'd also once again like to thank the River Forest Service Club for uh, organizing this event and allowing the League to uh, partner with them. They are going to have a meeting in here um, in just a, a few minutes. Uh, so we will vacate to the gallery if you'd like to meet the candidates and ask them any further questions. And remember on the 21st of March, same place, same time, different candidates, um, village president candidates and village trustee candidates will be here for the same kind of format. So hopefully uh, tell your friends and neighbors, hopefully the weather will be better and uh, we won't scare people away and we'll see you then. Thank you very much all for coming, thank you.